Great. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to another webinar produced by the Protect Child Health Coalition for all of our members across the United States. I'm Mark Bonkowitz, and I have a pleasure of being one of the six co-chairs of the PCHC, and I'll be the MC for today's webinar, which is called Make SEL DOA in Your School. And just in case you don't know what DOA is, that's dead on arrival. Boy, isn't that a great thing for SEL? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So we have 10 minutes allocated for question and answers after the presentation. So if you just want to write down your questions as we're going along, and then if they haven't been answered by the end of the presentation, then we'll entertain them then. You are in for a valuable presentation because these two women have collectively invested hundreds of hours in research, reading, analyzing, and collating information that you're about to receive. So due to some of the examples shown here today to prove the assault on our children, now would be the ideal time to move any children close to you into another room. At PCHC, we always believe in beginning and ending in a prayer. And so uh, we're just gonna have a few moments of silence and then everyone can pray for a successful webinar in our own faith tradition, and then we'll get started. Okay, our two speakers today are Kimberly Ells and Lisa Logan. And so I'm going to start with their bios, and I'll start with Kimberly first because I've known her the longest. <laughs> so Kimberly Ells is the author of The Invincible Family, Why the Global Campaign to Crush Motherhood and Fatherhood Can't Win. She is an avid researcher and writer on family issues and has worked as policy advisor for the past nine years. Kimberly has written for the Federalist, Town Hall, LifeSite News, Epic Times, The Daily Signal, and other outlets. She was featured on Tucker Carlson Today in June of 2022. I watched it, and she hit a grand slam home run. The ball was clear over the top of the back wall, still up in the air today. She's also <laughs> spoken at the United Nations and at other venues across the country. She graduated from Brigham Young University with a degree in English. She is married and the mother of five children. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce Lisa. She sent hers to me by text, and so I just need to get that on my phone. Was it a text or did you send it by email? I can't recall. It was text. Okay, that's what I thought. That's pretty dang. So I got to get to the day. That's my problem. Okay, it's coming up now. You can tell I am definitely IT challenged, can't you? <laughs> okay, here we go. Lisa Logan is the host of the YouTube channel, Parents of Patriots. In addition to being a mom of three children, she has a secondary education teaching credential in physical education and dance and serves on the board of a local charter school. To spread the word about the dangers of transformative social emotional learning, Lisa has presented for Freedom Works in DC and has been on numerous podcasts, including Prager University, and Benjamin Boyd, and was interviewed for the CRT documentary, Identity Marxism. You can find her on Substack at Education Manifesto and on Twitter at I am Lisa Logan. We are excited about the presentation you two young ladies are going to deliver, so take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so I entitled this presentation, The Theft of Education, SELing Out Our Kids. Uh, and I'm gonna start with this very iconic movie clip. Can you hear okay? Yeah. Did you ask me a question? 
I just want to make sure you guys could hear it. Okay. Now everyone remembers that scene, right? The the prize rushing on a pressure plate had to be swiftly swapped, swapped out for a bag of sand that was just right um, in order to not alert the guardian's booby traps that its treasure, its treasure was being stolen. And that's literally what's happened in education today. How you ask? Well, education is all about plugging children into the education to career workforce pipeline. And what it means to be college and career ready has been literally swapped out and stolen for another definition that requires social justice activism or something, a bag of something else that starts with an S that I won't mention. <laughs> and all of that pretty much makes it so that everything in education, our standards, our policies, our assessments, um, the data that we have compiled is all literally focused around um, building what's called emotional intelligent or social intelligence or soft skills for students through social emotional learning. Um, and for those of you who don't know, this is a very basic definition of social emotional learning put out by Castle, who we'll talk more about later. Um, it's the process through which children acquire the skills to recognize and manage emotions, develop caring and concern for others, make responsible decisions, establish positive relationships, and handle challenging situations effectively. Now, that sounds really amazing, right? I mean, what parent would not want their child to learn the skills that are on this slide? Uh, but that's honestly what makes it the perfect Trojan horse. And unlike other programs that kind of get co-opted by bad people and that started out with good intentions, the intention of SEL was clear from the beginning. In fact, uh, many of the originators of Common Core being put into education were the same originators of social emotional learning being thrust into education. I think they figured if they could nationalize standards around cognitive and academic skills, then they could then nationalize standards around what students should be thinking and feeling and believing through social emotional learning. And you ask, well, why children? Hitler himself understood that he alone who owns the youth gains the future. That's why by 1939, 90% of German children belonged to the Hitler Youth Organization. It allowed them to take them away from their parents. It allowed them to kind of indoctrinate these kids at a very plastic time in their lives, right, where they're very uh, influenced by factors. And many children even denounced their parents when they approved in ways not approved by the Third Reich. Um, same thing happened in China during Mao's Cultural Revolution. Um, he created in children what was called the Red Guard. You should look it up. And they indoctrinated these kids, um, made them think that these older generations, um, what they called the four olds, what encompassed old China was wrong. They needed to tear those systems down um, to, to create this new um, structure of, of government um, under Mao. And we really see this happening in social emotional learning too. I'm going to play, this is the introductory video for the middle school program for the social emotional learning program second step. And you'll kind of hear the same sort of rhetoric. Being a teenager today comes with other stresses too. The world is changing, maybe more dramatically than ever. See a school shooting school there? School is different for you than it was for your teachers and parents. You're facing issues other yeah, generations much. didn't have to think about. You see and hear about problems in injustice and suffering that are hard to ignore, especially when they affect you directly. But there are ways to navigate this time in your life. Decades of research have shown that social emotional learning, or SEL, the process of learning skills to get along with other people and manage your emotions, helps people feel better about themselves and find success in school and at work. So you kind of hear this, like, oh, these other generations, they just don't understand what you're going through. They just, they just don't get that you're in this other time. And these, these uh, social justice things that you're seeing in the world affect you and affect your future. Um, and that wasn't the only thing that Second Step was teaching. Um, and in fact, this program called Second Step is literally how I got involved um, in becoming an education whistleblower. I heard that this program was going to be taught at my child's school last year. And I started, like any curious person or investigator, kind of doing some research on it. In fact, um, what a lot of you don't, um, a lot of people don't understand is that some programs like this that are brought into our education system are actually copyrighted. And parents mm -hmm. can't even look at them. And so um, another parent and I decided to spend 
um, thankfully we're a stay at home moms that can do so, we were able to go into the district office and we spent over 30 hours reviewing the eighth grade curriculum alone. Um, <laughs> and just a second step right there is owned by Committee for Children. And that's gonna make a difference in a second when I talk about Committee for Children. Um, so these are just some of the things that we found and we were very alarmed. Um, we found that the eighth grade program um, said one of the three main social factors for bullying was power and privilege, which is a tenet of critical race theory. Um, now they didn't come right out and say that white people had the most power and privilege and they kind of did this in a very sneaky way. Um, they have these cartoons and the slides that they show to the kids and uh, almost always a person of color was in the role of the victim and a, a white person was in the role of the oppressor almost all throughout these, these slides. They also um, had a lot of advocacy for LGBTQIA and, and, and racial and gender causes um, overall. And they um, encouraged us to choose a disruption strategy or create a plan um, and follow these factors from their list in order to figure out how they could um, benefit these causes. Yeah, go get on this other. And black power. No one here to take a call. Um, maybe could, um, Jonine, could you please mute your mic? And I don't know if you want to go in the driveway or not. Could you? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so, again, social justice activism is really prevalent in these programs. Um, this is an example from sixth grade where one of the um, goals they could make um, an example uh, was to work for a social justice organization slipped ever so subtly between graduate from high school and learn one new dance routine this month. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was 11, working for a social justice organization was like nowhere on my radar. Um, here's an example of how they kind of tried to slip in um, elements of comprehensive sexuality education um, by teaching consent and the difference between sexual harassment and flirting, and they would give you examples and you had to classify which one of these examples belonged in sexual harassment and flirting. And when seeing if someone showed you pictures of a sexual nature at school, the message wasn't, well, it's always wrong for someone to show you pictures of a sexual nature at school. What category it fell in was determined by if, or if it bothered you or not. Uh, then we found the sexual inappropriate links. Um, inside the content. Um, they referred students to this link, loveisrespect.org. And if this was followed, um, and there was another one in the seventh grade called, called rain.org with two N's. Um, and if they followed these links, they would um, bring them to very sexually inappropriate material for minors. So 12 and 13 year olds would learn five tips for your first time. Um, and then that website led them to other websites like Scarletine and Planned Parenthood where they could learn how to have a safe self managed medical abortion. Uh, and what kind of tipped me off to even go in and look at the first place, and I would really recommend this for any social emotional learning program you have in your school district, um, is I just looked at their website. The website's always so telling, and I came across this webpage with anti-racism and anti-bias resources, and you might think, anti-racism, that means not racist, right? That's good. No. What this is, is Kendi's, Ibram X Kendi's version of anti-racism which means to say that it's not enough to not be racist. You have to be actively dismantling the systems that they believe are set up to purposely oppress people of color. They believe that the whole system is set up and is systemically racist. Um, and they say here, second step does, that they subscribe to Castle's new definition of transformative social emotional learning. Oh, I didn't set my timer. Um, <laughs> which earlier we said, wow, this definition looks really great. But in 2020, they changed that definition to be transformative social emotional learning. And they say that this form of SEL is aimed at redistributing power, gee, that doesn't sound Marxist, to promote social justice through increased engagement in school and civic life. Um, and here you see in their little graphic, their new circle, parents and caregivers, families and caregivers are three rungs out from the child, right, um, behind classrooms and schools. There's a problem there, right? Because parents are the primary caregivers of their children and should have um, the most influence on what their children are thinking and feeling and believing. Um, and, um, you know, social emotional learning is done through an equity lens, which really just means equal outcomes, right? They want everybody to have equal outcomes, not equal opportunity like we have um, with equality. And they even say in their white papers that racialized oppression was foundational to the establishment of the United States. 
Um, so it's very, very highly into this critical race theory type sphere. Um, and this is a huge problem because Castle themselves are the main organization that sets the standards and competencies for all social emotional learning programs. And in fact, they rate and review all the programs and many states won't even accept programs that aren't Castle approved. So um, you see here, they change their competencies completely um, in their SEL uh, roadmap to reopening school that was put together, that was shared with <laughs> schools across the nation. Uh, and for instance, in social awareness, <laughs> Not only does it require empathy and perspective taking, which you think, okay, well, great, that's fantastic, but they now have to, um, the perspective taking has to acknowledge that there's ongoing individual and institutional impacts of systemic racism. So they have to buy into this narrative in order to complete the competency. Uh, and this is important to note, Karenga, which is the global alliance, um, for social emotional learning skills. Um, they have a thing called a global steering committee and the head of CASEL, um, she's not anymore, she just stepped down and there's a new leader, but she was on that steering committee with someone from UNESCO. Um, UNESCO is a United Nations agency, we'll talk about them more in a minute and why that's important. And also hmm, four members from Committee for Children who own Second Step. Now UNESCO, um, stands for the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And they have um, this publication they put out, um, and they said um, social emotional learning is necessary to sustainable development goals. And we'll talk more about those in a minute. Um, but basically, they say that um, in this paper, that when children are confronted with some of the goals of the sustainable development goals, right? Environmentalism. Um, so let's just use that as an example. Um, and in order to uh, move to more green energy, for instance, they might have to sacrifice, right? Like for the for poor Californians who have to deal with these rolling blackouts. And that really creates this cognitive dissonance with their individual needs. So, right? When most people are confronted with collective goals, right, that might benefit society or are said to benefit society versus um, self-preservation, most people choose self-preservation, right? It's just our natural inclination to do so. And they say that this cognitive dissonance is a problem because it makes people not want to achieve the sustainable development goals. And they here say that um, uh, through this really creepy definition of E equals MC squared, but they shifted it um, to be EMC2, um, is that empathy and mindfulness taught through social emotional learning as well as critical inquiry, which you could read as critical consciousness, like a Marxian critical consciousness, um, would inculcate this emotional resilience that promotes pro-social behavior that wants children to fulfill the sustainable development goals. And they see here that recent experiences with SEL in schools show promise in improving pro-social behavior that inculcate actions that go beyond just the self but toward the collective good. But this, however, suggests a radical change in our education systems. Hmm. We'll talk in a minute about how radical that is, uh, but I wanna to pivot to the sustainable development goals because some of you might not know what those are. Um, these are 17 goals that the UN member states agree upon that kind of direct their funding and guide their vision for this 15 year period and they kind of direct all their energy towards these goals um, and we're in this this 2015 to 2030 period with the goals they want to accomplish by then um, and many of these sound like great goals right um, things that we would all agree upon we want people to have zero hunger and no poverty um, but many of these could be argued that they're they're trying to accomplish through the globalization and domination of literally all systems and civilizations in society. And so um, UNESCO, who I just mentioned, right, who's on the steering committee, they're in charge of SDG 4, um, quality and inclusive education for all. Um, and these are the targets of SDG 4. And I want you to notice this one, target 4.7 educational for sustainable development and global citizenship because unesco believes that all children should learn the same things um, through global citizenship education or what they call education for sustainable development and they say it aims to empower learners of all ages to assume active roles both locally and globally in building more peaceful tolerant inclusive and secure societies but you know, a lot depends on who is defining terms like these and how they plan to measure them. And I love this excerpt from Kimberly Ellsbuck. She says, 
Equitable and inclusive are elastic terms open to a wide range of interpretations. If deference to equity or equality is required, then young people who embrace the concept of free market systems wherein inequalities are allowed may be tagged as harboring attitudes that are unacceptably inequitable and targeted for re-education. If inclusiveness is applied to matters of sex, then holding specific beliefs about sexual conduct may be assessed as non-inclusive and therefore undesirable. In fact, inclusivity is commonly used to express acceptance of sexual variance. And that why, that's why it should be no surprise to you that UNESCO is one of the prime supporters of comprehensive sexuality education in the world. And they often partner with the International Planned Parenthood Federation. And they believe that through comprehensive sexuality education, children as young as five should be learning about sexual behaviors. And um, students as young as nine should be learning about self-stimulation and pleasure. Um, now, that's more comprehensive than many of us would ever, ever want for our children. Um, and so when they talk about a radical change in the educational system, what they mean is because they want people to really buy into these SDGs, we need to infiltrate SEL into our education system in literally every facet they possibly can. I often say it comes through third party woke middlemen, these standard bearers, right? I'll use accreditation as an example, right? Every high school has to be accredited in order if the students there want to go to accredited college. And so um, organizations like Cognia, who have a monopoly over the accreditation industry, and they've gone completely woke and buy into the whole systemic racism narrative, um, they'll come into a school district. And in order to be accredited, they require an equity audit. Well, they parse all the data and have them disaggregate it by race and gender. And any disparities and outcomes they use as evidence of racism. And then so you need diversity, equity, inclusion officer and programs, and you need more teacher training in order to, you know, be more um, sensitive and you need social emotional learning. And this is how this kind of all happens, but it happens through funding. It happens through um, assessments, um, surveys, uh, rules that your uh, state board will, will put forth, um, policy, et cetera. So, these are all this is not exhaustive but um, just know that it is literally infiltrated the entire system um and i'm going to use utah as an example um and one of the ways it comes in here um and actually 40 states have adopted um castles collaborating states initiative and are a part of that and utah is one of them uh, we have agreed to align education and workforce policy through an SEL lens um so castle uh, basically, as a part of career and workforce development, say, yeah, sure, you you um, have education and workforce development programs have SEL, therefore, your K-12 to should all be infiltrated with SEL because we need to teach skills for the workforce. Um, and so uh, we have agreed to embed SEL literally across the developmental spectrum um, and align that policy and uh, literally everything from our standards to our assessments to our policy to everything our out of, out of school programs are <laughs> everything is designed toward um, teaching social emotional skills um, and so basically we go to businesses and we say what um, SEL skills are you looking for in your workforce and then we teach those skills and that's a problem because I don't know if you've been paying attention but the workforce is pretty much in enslaved right now to a thing called ESG, and that stands for environmental, social, and corporate governance. So um, businesses who usually have a shareholder capitalism model where the main idea of the corporation is to return profit to their investors and their shareholders has now moved to a stakeholder capitalism model where um, basically the stakeholders are telling them what to do and these stakeholders have all these demands around the environment and um, social causes and and all of these things and if they don't um, apply their business practices to these ESG uh, metrics it affects their ESG score and businesses um, investors and banks look at this score um, and will do business with you are not based on it and so if they don't align their practices to these social causes and and, and all of these things, they they just won't get invested in and they won't be able to do business and they risk losing capital. And so as part of the G in ESG, companies are saying now because of these ESG, ESG centered goals that their hiring practices have to change, not just affirmative action policies, right? Which we know are 
are prevalent in the, in the industries, but also hiring people based on their emotional intelligence. Remember we talked about that umbrella and teaching kids emotional intelligence um, and these soft skills that are taught through SEL. Um, and Forbes notes that hiring decisions that used to be made based on a person's pedigree, the university they attended, the grades earned in the status of their last employer, um, without considering emotional intelligence, you know, they may be hiring brilliant jerks. Um, and so businesses are not doing that anymore. And, Six seconds, the Emotional Intelligence Network seems to think that hiring people based on emotional intelligence will dismantle the systems that contribute to what they call systemic racism, right? This CRT narrative. Um, you'd be surprised to know that ESGs are also built upon the sustainable development goals from the UN. I'm just going to play a small clip of this. The better defined metrics that meet the sustainable development goals are some days used to us reporting our financial metrics. So we got the big four to work together. They took all the metrics that were out there. They consolidated those metrics along the SDG platforms, people, planet, prosperity, principles of governance, four or five metrics in each. Then, and, and, and these are metrics people can report on. If you look at our annual report, you can see our report right there. They can sit there and say, these companies are above the bar. The idea here is that if you said everybody had the company, has to be a top. So he basically just goes on to say that, you know, <laughs> we measure and rank these companies. And of course, you know, whoever falls out the bottom, it's going to, they say it's going to self-lease itself, right? But we know that again these companies will be costed out of business if they don't comply but you heard him say there that these are based around the united nations sustainable development goals um and these stakeholders and this is a problem right because the co corporations are aligning their practices to the u.n sustainable development goals and all k-12 because again we're working through the education to workforce pipeline everything that encompasses college and career readiness is now about social emotional or emotional intelligence geared toward um, promoting these UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so we have so much social emotional learning literally everywhere in our system. Uh, and this is an even bigger problem because remember what I said, how it got swapped out for a bag of something else that starts with an S? What is literally expected of students to be college and career ready from both the school counselor's perspective and also um, a business perspective and higher ed perspective has changed. So. You see here that um, NACE, which is the National Association of Colleges and Employers, put out eight competencies um, in 2021 that they want to see in their workforce and in their um, college students. And you see there on the bottom left, equity and inclusion um, literally says that they have to engage in anti-racist practices, again, Kendi's version, um, that actively challenge the system structures and policies of racism. Uh, and that's just sample behaviors and then ASCA, the American School Counselors Association, also has changed um, what it means to be college and career ready. Um, so you see these codes on the left there, right, the BSS10, all those things like that. They, counselors use those codes um, to create learning objectives for students and groups and literally for the school system as a whole. And um, they're the main person that does that. And they crosswalked those standards with learning for justices or um, what used to be teaching for tolerances, social justice standards. So now you see under BSS 10, which is standard 13, students will analyze the harmful impact of bias and injustice on the world historically and today. And at the bottom there, number 20, um, students will plan and carry out collective action against bias and injustice. So they're saying they need to be social justice activists um really trying to dismantle the system in order to um, be college and career ready and therefore every student is at risk of not adopting these mindsets and behaviors and i think that's why they can justify bringing in these tier one solutions or whole school interventions like social emotional learning programs um, and they use title one funding and also medicaid funding in order to do it and they apply dsm codes to students to say um to justify why they need to use that money. Um, if, if you want to know more about that, I would follow at Hoge Anita, H-O-G-E-A-N-I-T-A -E on Twitter. Um, and we see this happening. It's they're not just teaching it, they're assessing it because again, they have to make sure these students adopt these mindsets. So this is a dashboard from Panorama Education. Um, and many states are adopting Panorama as an assessment tool um, to figure out where their students are landing in social emotional learning. And I'm going to uh, play a short clip from this as well. With Panorama, you can start by measuring students' social emotional learning skills and supports. With 
research back surveys and assessments. And it's easy to customize a survey that meets your district's needs, as you can choose from over 22 topics like growth mindset, social awareness, and self-management, or any of the topics that align to the Castle framework. The survey will take students about 10 to 15 minutes to complete, and teachers and staff can also rate their students' skills right from within Panama. Teachers can also subjectively measure that. immediate insight into student voice, what students are thinking, and how they feel about their skills, habits, and mindsets. See how each score compares to the overall statistical benchmarks. Then dig deeper and explore each topic in more detail, like how it's changed over time, or any gaps between student groups, and how students responded to each question individually. Then, Identify individual students' strengths and opportunities for growth by filtering student level SEL results to create smart groups which will update as new SEL surveys are run over time, allowing you to add specific students to a group for more targeted intervention and progress monitoring. And the best of all, our team will monitor that. Targeted intervention and progress learning. So if your child doesn't look like they're doing well enough in social awareness or whatever, they're going to target your kid or student for intervention, right? And they get to decide what the definition of, definitions of those terms are. And if you notice, they said they were aligned to Castle's framework, right? So in a survey like this, when it says at the top there, how often do you spend time at school with students from different races, ethnicities, or cultures? And they give this survey to the students and they say almost never, does that count against their score in social awareness? And does that go on their, their record? So if ESG is a social credit system for corporations, SEL is a social credit system for our students. And will this affect their ability to get a job or get into college later? And I think that's the, that's the biggest worry for me as a parent um, and this, these are just another ways that um, our state has adopted um, these social emotional skills to contribute to the workforce. We have portrait of a graduate um, and these 13 competencies um, are mostly social emotional. Uh, many states have portrait of a graduate. It's actually part of a national program um, called Patel for Kids. It's Gates funded and they work with Castle or Institute Excel in it at Knowledge Works um, to bring this into states. Knowledge Works is like a future forecasting uh, company, and they are also working with our state to move us into personalized competency based learning, which uh, learning isn't measured by seat time anymore. They want um, and grading. Um, they want to move away from that system and into a competency based structure where children check off competencies um, and there's more of like a learn anytime, anywhere type of um, environment, right? And so Learning is measured by what competencies a student adopts. And uh, KnowledgeWorks is happy to do this because they say grading is racist and tool the colonizer. Um, <laughs> they literally say that on their website. And they view personalized competency based learning as a path to liberatory education. Um, and if that doesn't sound uh, crazy, it actually is. Um, so if social emotional learning is embedded into every subject, um, and policy and whatever else. Liberatory education wants to make sure that critical theory is embedded into every subject. Um, and the whole purpose of learning will be to create a crit critical consciousness in children um, so that they want to overthrow the system. I'm going to um, pass a little bit of this, um, but I want to make the point that um, where they're headed with SEL is literally um, through school choice, they want to create a single system. Um, because here's the thing, in order to have all students um, participate in uh, this paradigm where they teach and measure and track social emotional skills and this feeds into the workforce, they need every student and they don't have private education, right? So homeschoolers and private school, they don't have to take the state assessments. Um, and so um, this is worrisome because um, Global Silicon Valley Advisors who sees is for school choice. Uh, they put out a document in 2012. Um, not only do you see charters and school choice um, as one of the steps um, on this map here, um, but they say they want to do away with local school boards, basically public education and representation, and eventually have an open online campus. 
Um, and this is the future of social emotional learning um, where these public private partnerships and I literally found this um, slide deck um, happened upon it on the internet. Uh, this is what they're planning. I would look up the Internet of Education um, and be very, very afraid about um, who these people are. Um, all of these organizations, we see Microsoft, IBM, all these ESG centered folks want to um, have the system be interoperable and have this data that people are all their social emotional skills and their competencies they have to be shared across these systems through blockchain type technology the same technology behind bitcoin and other digital currency and the people behind this are the u.s department of education uh, the u.s chamber of commerce there's your scl and esg pipeline and people like unesco who want all children again to learn comprehensive sexuality education for instance and be um, stewards for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so uh, I just want to note that they say on their website that they want to use these school choice bills to regulate private education so that every single child um, and every um, system of education can be um, enforced through government equity initiatives and that's tied to the funding. Uh, itself. Um, and I would like to note that um, I'm very curious as to why American Federation for Children chose an expert from UNESCO's Inclusive Policy Lab to be the face and voice of this movement to pass the ESA and voucher bills. Um, and uh, assessments are written into many of these HOPE scholarship bills um, or ESA vouchers, and they're sometimes hidden under accept clauses. They have federal anti-discrimination laws in there. Um, and also the fact that many state constitutions say that state boards of ed have plenary power or general control and supervision over public education, which is anything using public dollars. Um, so our state board um, of ed went to um, court with the Charter School Board Association back in 2001 uh, when charter schools came onto the scene. And you see here that um, they lost, the Charter School Board Association lost because they said, according to our state constitution, they had power and control over public education. Um, so therefore they could be regulated by the USBE. So I just wanna kind of end, I know I ran a little bit over, sorry, Kimberly, um, that we need community solutions to these problems, not government funded solutions. With government money comes all sorts of government strings and regulations. Um, and I know a woman who homeschools 10 people's kids, um, therefore they're able to share the curriculum and they're able to work out transportation. Um, we really need community solutions. And I would say first, um, most of all, um, and Kimberly does a great job of talking about this in her book, keep your family unit strong and connected. Teach your children about patriotism, teach them about the dangers of communism and socialism, and um, demand parental rights for your children's um, data and your data. And um, I would say educate yourself. You know, um, I have so much videos and kind of walk you through the whole thing on parents to patriots um, and help other parents to understand and, and other lawmakers and other district members to, to know what the true agenda behind SCL really is. And um, so yeah, there's how you can follow me and, and thank you so much for allowing me to present today. Thank you, Lisa, wonderful job. Wow, a lot of data there, a lot of research. Okay, Kimberly. We're ready to hear your perspective. Not, not sure. Do you, do you have slides, Kimberly? No, I don't. Okay. I'm going to go low. I'm going low tech today. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'll still stop sharing so people can see your beautiful face. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So, Lisa, thank you. I mean, as you all can see, Lisa's full of so much information that you can hardly take it in. And she's painted, you know, a very full and uh, frankly, a little bit frightening picture of kind of the overtake of our schools through all of these different means. Um, just so you know what to expect, my remarks will be much shorter than Lisa's. I'm kind of the, we're going to talk about some specific things. I am going to talk briefly about UNESCO, a little bit more a specific piece of that puzzle. Then I'm going to talk about some action items and some strategies. And then we'll talk about a few good, potentially good SEL programs that you can that you can look to. So that's, that's what I'm going to cover. Um, it somewhat briefly. So um, as Lisa has so well explained, um, UNESCO is a primary force behind the SEL movement worldwide. There are a lot of uh, actors, but they are kind of the, the gas behind the whole machine. And one major way that UNESCO advocates for SEL is through what's called the Mahatma, UNESCO's Mahatma Gandhi 
Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. And doesn't that sound so lovely because we all love Gandhi, right? And he was very peaceful and he has, we, we have respect for him. So that's why they've named this uh, UNESCO entity after him is so that we will uh, automatically have this deference. But but should we do that? My answer is is no. So the, the article that Lisa mentioned, um, just to point it out one more time, it was SEL, for the SDGs, why social and emotional learning is necessary to achieve the sustainable development goals. That title could not be more clear about the intent of using SEL to, to forward the UN's agenda. That article is found in an online publication called The Blue Dot. The Blue Dot, that title refers, that's the earth. So it's very um, environmentally focused, peace focused, uh, sustainable development supposedly focused, uh, uh, publication. So I would highly recommend that you go to the Mahatma Gandhi Institute website and look around. So here's the website. Maybe we can send this out to you. It's mgiep, M-G-I-E-P dot UNESCO dot org. And I'm pointing this out specifically because it'll be useful to you just to browse around and to see it will be become very clear very quickly that the push for LCL is global. It's not necessarily about teaching Tommy and Johnny to get to get along on the playground as it often is portrayed. If you look at this website, mgiep.unesco.org, you can see that it's a global agenda and you can share that with others. And I'm gonna talk more about that in just a minute. So um, it, it becomes clear that the end game of SEL is not to meet the social and emotional needs of each child but to shape children to meet the needs of a global society and achieve the SDGs as Lisa has so well explained. Um, and she already talked about the, uh, the dissonance aspect. So we want to, they say that we want to reduce children's dissonance, their resistance to the goals and all peoples. And that's, that one article even says, um, dissonance can be caused by beliefs, attitudes, values, and feelings. And therefore they want to change children's beliefs, attitudes, values, and feelings. Um, so, so, but, but why, why do they want to do that? Well, they're on a mission to, in their, in their words, you know, save the world, not necessarily, I find it interesting, not necessarily save the people in the world, but save the world. Um, and specifically they sell, and this is a key piece for me when I saw this, um, uh, one of the program specialists for the Gandhi Institute says, SEL skills are powerful competen competencies that have been shown to instill pluralistic thinking. And so, in short, the proponents of the Sustainable Development Goals and SEL want to instill pluralistic thinking in your child in the name of global peace. Now, again, there's a good definition of pluralistic. There's also a bad definition of that. And if we're teaching children to consider others' feelings, that's a positive. But if we're teaching children to become disinterested in their own individual rights, then that's problematic. Um, another quote that is telling is from uh, a writer from the Blue Dot said that we that we have the potential to influence the development of the next generation of global citizens. So if you if you have this kind of uh, language right from the horse's mouth, um, then you can be powerful in advocating against SEL, right? And, and again, I'll get to more of that in just a minute. Um, again, emphasizing a point that Lisa made in another article in the Blue Dot, a learning coordinator for the Gandhi Institute said, that they recognize the need to move beyond only academic purposes of education. Most of us are sending our children to school to have a, an academic education, not to receive you know, therapy and to talk about their feelings per se. Um, so that's a huge change in the purpose of education and it's happening right under our eyes. Okay, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here, but also uh, one other point from the Gandhi Institute says that it has digital platforms that quote, show great promise for massive scaling. And so they've already produced a suite of digital uh, videos that address issues on migration, nationalism, nationalism and violence. And that doesn't sound like, you know, being nice in the classroom on, or on the playground, that's very different. I also find it interesting that as you look around on their website and some of their uh, materials, their grand answer to supposedly make kids more social is not to interact with other human beings, but to put them on electronic devices and have them listen to you know, digital curriculum instead of actually being social, which happens naturally when you go to school. Okay, 
again, on the, on the Gandhi Institute's website, they say that their recommendations are prescribed as general guidelines for education decision maker, makers at the national level, right down to school boards and schools. So they themselves are saying, the recommendations we're, we're making here are intended to guide school boards and schools. Um, another thing that they say is that, um, and I'll quote it, there is a need to be in, to have an intentional focus, such as a campaign organized by a coalition of partners led by UNESCO to communicate a common and unified message on the importance of SEL to parents and the public at large. So they're trying, they know they need to sell SEL to parents because it's not parents who are asking for it by and large. Parents aren't lining up at the school doors saying, can you please, please teach my child about the sustainable development goals and how to be a global citizen? We don't see that happening. It's very much a top down uh, movement. All right. So um, developing the attributes of kindness and compassion and empathy in children is a noble goal. We all want this. Right. And some of that development can, in fact, happen at school. And there can be discussions at school about kindness and empathy. That's not inappropriate per se, right? But local programs and local communities and individual families are the best ways to instill social and emotional skills in children and to maintain free society in, in the process. Okay, so moving on to some action items. Is there a solution to this big global infiltration of, of schools through SEL? Yes, um, there are several options. First and foremost, we need to decline to utilize programs that are linked to global education in initiatives. So as of now, only a portion of schools in a portion of states, roughly half I would say, um, are required by their state education standards to provide SEL training in the classroom. Uh, this is changing because UNESCO thinks that state standards should require SEL, but this is an area where you in your local area can take action. I went to my local, there, my district is choosing right now what social and emotional programs are going to use in our schools. And I went uh, to a meeting not long ago about that and I got asking a lot of questions and I asked one of our school admin uh, district administrators, I said, well, are we required to adopt? Because they had showcased seven different programs that we could quote, choose from, which were all aligned with CASEL's guidelines. And I said, do we have to do this? And she said, no, we don't have to. And I said, okay, well, let's start there. They, at this point, we don't have to, but it puts educators in a bad place because if they refuse to do SEL, it's like, what? You don't want to support the social and emotional wellness of the children in your district? Do you see how it's tricky? And so it gets people um, in administrative positions and schools at large to voluntarily go along with all these global uh, initiatives. So you know, UNESCO doesn't have to have it heavy handedly come down into your school necessarily, they're they're getting people to come on board voluntarily by putting CASEL up as the grand measurer and, and the great standard setter that we all just have to follow. And so people are just doing that because they think they have to. They don't have to. So if you can help your local school uh, administrators see that they don't have to, if it's not yet in your state standards, they don't have to adopt any SEL programs. If they want to, to kind of, because there may be legitimate needs and because they want to feel good about what they're doing, we can help them to choose ones that are not riddled with all these things Lisa has just showed us, the critical race theory and all of those things. Um, so try to keep SEO requirements out of your state curriculum standards, work with your state school board and help, th help them understand you know, the global agenda. Now, second thing, we need to educate educators. Don't assume the worst. Um, don't treat them as your enemies. How would they know all this stuff that you just learned if nobody told them? They wouldn't know, right? Um, so for instance, my little son at the current time is in public school because I have not found something that I feel better about at this point. He's in first grade. And um, I went into his class this week to volunteer to kind of see what was going on. And I'll tell you, I had noticed coming home on his little report for the week, um, it says social studies. And underneath that, the first week it said emotions. And the second week under social studies, it said community. And I'm like, oh, good grief. What is this? Because social studies used to be history, government, maps, you know, things like this. And do you see how they've used the word social, social studies, 
social and emotional skills, social issues. So they've hijacked that whole thing. So I went in, volunteered at the class, had a lovely experience, and then I asked the teacher, can I see that curriculum? The teacher is extremely nice. She's a young mom herself. She has no idea about the global, you know, strings attached. And um, she showed me just some books that they read. And I asked, where does, where does it come from? Where do, who creates the curriculum? Do we have to do this? And so she showed me kind of the steps back, back to the district. And she showed me what she's actually doing in the classroom with my son. And guess what? I'm actually fine with the things they're doing so far. Now, I know that the writing is on the wall and that the more we implement SEL, that will change. But but my if I would have gone in and said to my son's teacher, I can't believe you're teaching about emotions in the classroom. That is SEL. And that is linked to the global conglomerate of, you know, education people who want to destroy the world. Like I would have sounded like a total nut. And I would have been because she is not doing that. Right. My son's teacher does not have evil intent. The principal of the school does not have evil intent. And we need to kindly and in a very informed way, tell people about these things, show them the global agenda and in a sense, be a warning voice for what is coming. Not all SEL programs are bad. Not all ways children have been taught to be nice at school in the past are bad. It would be unfair to say that, right? Um, so we have to show the global roots. We have to quote UNESCO. We have to quote Castle. We have to help people see for themselves where these things are coming from. And if that's a road we want to go down, and hopefully they'll choose not to. So as we work with educators, um, one thing that works well is to set up a meeting and come prepared, first of all, with kindness, second of all, with researched information and something to leave with them. An example from my district. I have district. I have two friends named Leslie and Sandy, and they've taken uh, my book and excerpts from my articles and other information that they've found, and they made an appointment with our uh, superintendent. And they very nicely, they're the nicest, they're, they're grandmothers, and they set up an appointment, presented information to her, not too much. They didn't overwhelm her with all of the things we've told you today, um, asked her to read a portion of my book, and set up an appointment to come back and talk with her again. They also included in the discussion, we have a district SEL um, specialist or whatever. And he seems pretty open to hearing what we have to say. Again, he's not aware. He doesn't know the, the, the kind of can of worms that SEL is, is opening up. And so they're slowly and nicely, very informed way, teaching them uh, so that they can hopefully make a better choice. Um, in, so next thing, in addition to educating educators, we need to educate others, other parents, our family members. And, and in a non-inflammatory way share what we are learning and what we understand um, with examples okay and that will be up to you to do that one place that you can obviously follow lisa on twitter at i am lisa logan um, all of my articles are available at invinciblefamily.com there's a little tab at the top invinciblefamily.com and i address a lot of these issues in bite-sized pieces right obviously my book is helpful and you can pick that up it's the invincible family but um, not everyone's going to read a book, but they might read an article. And so you can access, you know, my articles there. I talk about, uh, I have two very recent articles on SEL that might be helpful to you. Okay. So um, kind of lastly, uh, there, I wrote one of my articles recently that you, some of you may have seen is four good SEL options. Um, so, and I spoke directly to the creators of each of these programs. In fact, Janine McKenzie, I think is on this call, one of them, she is the program mm -hmm. creator. And none of them collect or share da data on students other than to track, you know, their own effectiveness, like they track student progress that they report only to themselves, right? Just so that they have um, data showing that their, their programs are effective in helping kids. But they're not collected to global entities and they, they're not about any of that. But they do most, I believe all of them meet the SL standards required in most school districts. So I'm just going to tell you what they are quick, quickly and then go look at my article for, for the websites. My Hero Journey. It focuses on helping every student become the hero of their own story and discover their unique talents and zero in on the, their vision for their life and then align their daily choices with that vision. That's acceptable, right? Um, that's a good model. I, I, my daughter took a class by, by this um, organization. It was fantastic. 
Real Essentials that Jonine McKenzie has put forward. Uh, it's for high school, middle and high school age and, and some college age curricula, uh, just focused on gaining relationship skills. Again, not not to get people in line with the SDGs. For younger children, dash into learning, a series that includes an emotional resilience program based on based on fairy tale characters for children aged five to 10. So, oh, and then the last one, the positivity project. So there's two gentlemen who um, were deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. And when they came back, they wanted to do something good in society. And they saw that helping kids um, develop resilience, um, and positive character traits was something that had helped them in their service in the military and otherwise in their families. And they they wanted to help kids do it that way. So they 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 created the positivity project. And their the motto of the program is other people matter, right? So it's really great. And it has connections that you can use to talk about these things in your family as well. And that's really important to them. All right. Um Parents and teachers don't need to look to global institutions to teach children social and emotional skills. We know how to do that already. We know what, what um, a healthy child and a healthy person looks like. And we know how to teach children to, to do those things. And they're best taught early in the home. And I'll throw in, especially by mothers. And they can then be supported in the classroom in appropriate ways. This, this only can happen, however, when basic morality is agreed upon. And that's where uh, that where it used to be common ground is fast disappearing or is already gone. Like in my local school, I feel like there is still basic moral agreement on what is right and wrong. And so my the teacher in my child's school is going to basically be on the same page as me. But that's, of course, very much not the case you unique in, in many places. Are, so many people in now the world the, tend to suppress their views, mainly because think, they feel it may. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now just let me take a couple minutes to wrap up. So now is a great time to talk to your local school administrators and invite them to resist the push to implement social emotional learning programs. Or if SEL is required, invite them to utilize programs that enhance local control, promote parental involvement, and are not entangled with the global education movement. Finally, if you believe um, from your own observation that your school is beyond hope, Hope is still not lost. You are the hope. And all the like-minded people around you are the hope. And even if, even if all of these plans that Lisa and I have laid out today happen, and our, our public schools are overtaken with this corrupted curriculum, guess what? It, it's still not hopeless because our families are more powerful than they will ever be. And they're founded on a false foundation. And that is going to fall. And, and eventually kids will come to see through that. You know, I, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of sadness and brokenness in the meantime. But but truth will triumph and truth can triumph in our families right now, even if our public schools are a mess. You have the privilege of directing your child's education and upbringing, and you have the guts and the know-how and the wisdom to find or to create the best educational path forward for your children or your grandchildren or the, the kids you care about in your neighborhood. And if you decide that public school is a too dangerous an option for your child, you will find another way. And if you're a praying person, God will help you. And there are many options that already exist and endless ones that can be created. So now let me invoke the name and wisdom of Gandhi um, to pull out your heartstrings. He said, as we all know, be the change you want to see in the world. So if we don't like what, what's happening in education, create something else. And I know that we're preaching to the choir here because you all are already doing that. But it's something to to keep in mind. I, th I think it's inspirational. We don't we don't have to rely on all these other systems. We can create what we need. Um, if if because of your circumstances, public school is the only option that works for you right now, but you're concerned, then you can unteach your children at home. Read chapter 22 of my book and be inspired. It's worth it just for that. Or read the whole original story in the book called The Bridge at Andau by James Mishner. It's so worth it. It's so inspiring. The dil a, a diligent family can fortify itself amid almost any storm, almost any storm. And we have to be diligent and consistent, but we can do it. Families are strong and they're stronger than all of these global forces that we've outlined today. They have billions of dollars. Guess what? We don't, but we don't need it because we have something better. We have the truth. And we have love. And in the end, that will triumph. So thank you. Wonderful, Kimberly. Thank you so much. 
All right, we have a few minutes here for questions, but before we take questions, uh, just a couple of them that came out of the chat. Yes, this recording will be available. My goal will be to have it uh, up on the PCHC uh, webinar um, folder as of tomorrow. I'll get the copy of the slides from one of these two delightful young ladies and uh, they will be accompanied there. So you can watch the uh, slides while you're listening to their video. It looks like Lois has a question she would like to ask. So Lois, why don't you unmute yourself and go ahead and ask it. Yes, hi, um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, Kimberly, I really appreciate your comment about talking to your teacher. That's really, really important, you know, and, and being in communication there. And I, I just have a question about, I haven't heard about these, uh, these private SEL uh, deliverer companies that aren't uh, supposedly, I'm skeptical about the data, just because they say it's, they're not giving it out. I mean, the, the school districts are, are, if they're collecting data, uh, somebody's got that data, how can they guarantee that that data isn't going to be shared? And, and what is going to happen with that data, even if you think that this uh, SEL program isn't necessarily connected with UNESCO, they're still, they're still assessing your kids' values and beliefs, and, and how, how, do you, how can you trust where that's going to go? And at some point, um, if, they're going to, if they're going to put together social credit scores on our children, if they're collecting the data, somebody is going to get somebody is going to you know the government at some point is going to just tell these companies you have to give us this this data so i uh, i'm just i don't really see how that it may be like 10 percent better than the other programs but i don't see how uh it's really like you should anyone should rest on their laurels because they have a you know and a different type of sel program if you want to um you know address that Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you, Lois. Good question. And I noticed, unfortunately, Janine McKenzie just got off. I was going to refer to her because she is she runs one of these programs and she could speak directly to that. But like, for instance, um, the kind of data collection that I'm talking about that they do would be just like an asset, not tracking your children's beliefs, but just like at the beginning of the program, how did they feel their relationship skills were on a scale of 10, one to 10, something like that. And at the end of the program, how they felt about it then. It would be more like those kinds of assessments, only so that they could show to potential, you know, users of the system that it, that it works, you know. And that's pretty much standard practice for almost any program that you you need to have a way to show that it's effective. So the data they collect is not the kind of data that uh, that Lisa was showing about. How oh the, how, are, do they play with? people that are not of their race how well did they ever get in fights like it's not like that at all from my understanding and like I said I did speak to the creators of all these programs personally so um data collection is not a huge part of what they do the dash into learning I don't believe collects data at all it's just you read kids these simple little books and talk about them so you're right we should never rest on our laurels but I feel pretty confident that the four I've found and I hope that we find others uh are fairly safe you know we can never be totally sure but but these they're created by local people for local reasons and then they've found that it can be helpful more broadly and so they've been implemented in other schools but they didn't start from a place of global influence does that make sense mm -hmm. very good okay good answer all right i don't see any other hands up but we still have a minute or two if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question go right ahead if you'd like uh, do you know also, uh, my other question was, uh, do either of you ladies know, or does anybody know of any school districts that have just um, said no outright to social emotional learning anywhere? Um, I want to make the point that, um, and this is why I think I have a problem with these um, school choice bills. It doesn't address um, the main reason why a lot of these SEL programs have come in, which is the Every Student Succeeds Act. So almost all states have had to comply with measuring and tracking and teaching SEL because as a requirement of SF in 2015, um, the federal government, if you any state takes Title I funds, they have to report back to the federal government 
on one non-cognitive factor. And many states that um, the school climate, when it, it ushered in social emotional learning. And so what you have to report on, um, everything that's in public education has to be measured and everything you have to measure and assess, you have to teach and what you have to teach has to be involved in your standards. And this is how it literally got infiltrated everywhere. So I don't know of any states that were able to completely say, no, we're not going to, unless they decided to not use that as a factor. But and maybe Kimberly knows the answer to that question too. Maybe she knows of some, I don't know. No, and I, I don't know, have any additional information for more than what you've said. Right, so I mean, maybe if a state didn't take Title I funding, they could say no. They could say no. Right, and, and that's that's a, another broader solution. Like if states, if, gov if governors would have the guts to cut their federal education funding, we could largely uh, retain some autonomy locally, but that's that's really hard to sell publicly because people start yelling about prioritizing education and oh you you're not going to take the money because you don't care about our kids and so for for politicians that's a very tricky situation. But gosh, we need to do that because if we not if we're not taking their money, then we don't have to comply with what they say, right. which is what Lisa is getting at. I don't know how many of you are really familiar with the school choice bills efforts that she's referred to but people are just in short people are saying well i'm not using the public school so give me my money back so i can use it on the school i want which in theory sounds great except that the money has then run through the system and you're getting the money from the government which time has shown that over years that people who have done this then that that entails accountability for the spending of that money then assessments come with it and that I believe that will become a stranglehold and that way see then all as they say, then all schools will be publicly funded because all the money will be if they ask if they get people to buy onto school choice like oh yeah i'm going to take the money and not go to public school. Then all schools will be publicly funded, you see that's the problem, and then they will be eventually uh, subject to the same requirements. Literally eliminating all of your choices <laughs> all choices will be the same. Because UNESCO's, UNESCO is UNESCO serious when they say all children and not just all children, all people. They want all people to be educated in their way. And so they're going to find ways that look appealing to get people to do it. It's all very coercive, but done in a very um, suave manner to get people to come on board voluntarily. Excellent. Great answers. OK, we have time for one more question if anyone has one. I was just wondering, can we, the recording that will be then published, can we use it I'm at Moms for Liberty, for example, can we use those recordings so that we can all, that whole group can watch it? Or do you want to keep it just in here in this group with the people here that participated? Uh, we made a decision with the six co-chairs that everything uh, except for the legislative webinars would be open for sharing with the public. Okay. So spread it as far and wide as you can so that we can help as many parents and children as possible. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Right, thank and uh, Karen, I actually had a mom from Moms for Liberty um, contact me and she took my whole Sinister SEL series and they met for six weeks and every week would play a video um, from my YouTube channel and discuss oh, and okay. talk about how deeply and so, that's just another idea of something that you can do to, to really educate your group about the subject. Okay, awesome, thank you. Okay, well, we're gonna bring this meeting to webinar to a close. I just can't thank uh, our two presenters enough. Uh, Kimberly and Lisa, you just did a spectacular job. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being so well-prepared and energetic and uh, great presenters. So as I mentioned earlier, the goal will be to have this recording process and post on the mobilize in the webinar folder tomorrow, okay? Uh, before we have our closing prayer, I would just like to ask Kimberly if she would share from her perspective why it would be valuable for everyone to give real serious prayerful consideration to coming to our PCHC Summit in Irving, Texas on Friday and Saturday, November 11th and 12th. So Kimberly, Thank you, Mark. 
Thank you. The PCHC is hosting a summit. We have a yearly one. It's 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 in November on the 11th and 12th in Irving, Texas. And um, if you're interested in these issues at all, it will be worth coming. I spoke at the one last year. Sharon Slater, who's kind of my boss, is going to be speaking at the one this year. It'll be worth it just to come hear her. And the networking opportunities um, are fantastic. And you can learn from what other people are doing in other parts of the country. The whole purpose of it is to bring people from around the country who are like-minded and focusing on these issues together so that then we can learn from each other, share strategies, and cooperate. Very well said. And I can tell you, being a sales professional by background, the, the networking that Kimberly mentioned is absolutely powerful because this whole PCHC started with divine intervention of two women who got together. One of them lived in Hawaii and the other one lived in South Carolina. Now you can't get hardly farther apart than that <laughs> in the United States than that distance. And somehow God connected them together and just continued to grow and multiply to, to see what we have today with almost 240 members in over 40 states. So it's worth the time and the energy. You'll get a huge return on your financial investment. Okay, as we bring this to a close, we're just going to take a few moments so that we can all offer a silent prayer of thanksgiving in our own faith tradition for the information that was shared this afternoon. Okay, thank you one and all. God bless you. Have a great rest of your afternoon and evening. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.